Um, so Yoti is all about letting people prove who they are or how old they are, either face to face or online. And if you think of a reusable digital ID, it's something that you can set up once and then have a more privacy preserving way of sharing different things about you, maybe just your age, just the fact that you're over 18 or over 13. And that's a way of helping to build trust online, it might be when you're buying and selling a secondhand good, it might be when you're dating, it might be when you're going for a new job, or as you said, going to right to work checks, right to rent checks. There's lots of different ways in our everyday life that we want to have trust in the people that we're dealing with. We all saw during COVID that there was huge amounts of fraud, for instance, and the UK government lost somewhere between 15 and 20 billion um, because we weren't at that stage checking the identities of people that were applying for COVID loans. So I think all in all, this is an area where people can think and have options, but have new ways to prove things about themselves, their identity or their age. So how does it work? What, what does the process involve to register yourself? Sure. So you download an app from the App Store um, and then you have a document such as your passport, your driving license, maybe a citizen card in the UK. And in about three to five minute process, you're um, taking a selfie, you're adding a document and then that document is checked. And then you set up this reusable digital identity. And once you've set it up, you can then just share, for instance, you're over 18 or over 13. On this video that you can see there in a supermarket, you could have several options. You could wave over the attendant as normal, or you could scan a code and share just the fact that you're over 18. There was another option on that screen, which was a different one for, for age. Now, it, it sounds all very benevolent. Does it not, Silky Carlo? Maybe this is going to be about convenience. My blood is running slightly cold. I, ca I can't lie, and, and that's why I'm so happy that, that you're here, because I want to hear both sides. Silky, does this worry you? There will always be the potential for some benefits with different forms of digital ID and definitely convenience in certain circumstances. A supermarket till, for instance, will be one of them. But the bigger picture is that digital ID, especially large state run centralized systems, have the potential to be a vehicle for enormous control. Uh, we go from operating on broadly a trust-based system in lots of scenarios or having certain bits of paper ID um, to being nations of people who walk around on license uh, with a digital um, identifier that gives you certain rights and permissions. You know, I'm uncomfortable, for example, and Julie describes that the first step in dating might be to check someone's papers. Um, that's a kind of nightmare citizen policing future that I really hope that we don't live in. Um, and of course, you know, there's an enormous scope for function creep here, what's called mission creep, where you start with something that's just about showing you're over 18 to buy a bottle of wine. And then suddenly it becomes a digital ID that has all kinds of permissions and licenses as part of it. And that's what this EU scheme is looking like at the moment, something very expansive. And obviously, we saw during the pandemic how, uh, you know, with the introduction of digital COVID passes, how suddenly um, any kind of digital ID was going to be used to deny people health care, exclude them from certain places, even lock them in their own homes. Um, so it really can be a, a slippery slope. Julie, do you agree it has the power to be incredibly uh, discriminatory? So I think even in today's world with a physical document, it, it can also be discriminatory. There are over a billion people on the planet that don't have a physical document and don't have any way to prove who they are or how old they are. And also, Suki mentioned the point of it being state run. Well, there are many private sector organizations that are providing independent identity and age checking and letting you share not all of the details from your document, but just what's needed when it's needed, specifically to prevent fraud and to give people more options. So absolutely, I agree with Silky. Probably the only point we agree on is the fact that it should be something that's optional. People should have choices of different ways to prove age and prove identity and decide what works for them. So for instance, over 12 million people already have opted to set up a digital identity with Yoti um, and even more, over 500 million to do age checking. So I think part of it is a consumer choice. Will there be a choice, though, eventually? Because, of course, once it becomes too inconvenient to leave the house, 
without your phone so you can scan your QR code or, or, or let's even go further, it reads your face when you walk into the supermarket. You won't have a choice, will you, Silky? It seems inevitable that choice is going to be gone like that. It's one of the really big risks here. And even if you look at, for example, nightclubs, which is one of the environments where digital IDs are regularly required now, and I think Yoti does a lot of business in, in that area, um, it's quite common for um, people on the doors to expect that you might have a digital ID or for them to scan a pass, so basically to di digitise it. Um, and that's when you do see risks and also the risks of this, you know, the biometric element of this which is where it gets really different from, from paper um, identification, is that you can create databases. And so you see with these kinds of facial recognition providers that, you know, even on a regional basis or a citywide basis, um, lots of different nightclubs might have access to the same pot of data. Or you were thrown out of this nightclub a few weeks ago or Bouncer took a disliking to you here or a, a security card wrongly suspected that you stole something from this supermarket. That's where it gets really dangerous as well. And, you know, obviously Yoti is in the business of biometrics. Most of these digital IDs are going towards biometrics where where, you know, now it's not just that you've got a provisional driving license that shows your age, but you've got something as sensitive as your DNA that could also be linked with your internet use, your financial habits, your behaviours, where you go, all kinds of information. And that's what the kind of, uh, obviously, health information as well. Um, and that is really what is starting to happen at the European yeah. level, which is a real, real risk. Julie, it's the stuff of nightmares. Please make us sleep easy at night. I'm terrified. So do you know that even today, there are 99 million physical identity documents that are on Interpol's databases lost and stolen. In the UK, you have a million driving licenses every year. And loads of these are lost in the nighttime economy, people out and about. I'm not worried about that. I'm not worried about losing my passport and someone finding it. That's not my worry. My worry oh, is... The worry really is when that document is taken by a fraudster, because that then can lead into quite a lot of identity theft and even more difficulties for you. But I'm worried about that document being taken by the government and then used okay. against against my free will by present, preventing me from doing something so, like the Chinese social credit system. So at the moment in America, is it we, uh, sorry, in, in China, is it WeChat? They have a, an app that you might be familiar with and it will beep on a person's phone if you're in the vicinity of someone with a low social credit score. So if you then hang out in the vicinity of that person with a low social credit score, whatever they've got that for, a parking offence or not putting their bins out on time, your social credit score goes down. That's social engineering by any other definition, isn't it, Julie? I would agree, but that's not what really what we're talking about. We're talking about a way for people to prove who they are or how old they are. These aren't government-owned methods, and we yeah. don't have a surveillance approach. <laughs> so if you set up a Yoti, for instance, the government does not have access to any of that data. You are the only person that has all of your transactions. We can't even see what you or I do on a day-to-day -day basis with your Yoti. So you're able to share less information with organisations and share what you choose when you choose. And there's not a centralised record of a, in one column of all the things that you're doing at all. So that is Good. one of the key things that are opposite of surveillance. Good. Good. And I hope, it, I hope it remains that way. Silky, do you feel reassured? Because the idea that at the moment we have lots of different files all over the world with lots of our data, I, I can kind of get my head around that. What I hate is the idea that there's one file in the world that's got Bev Turner on it. And in that file is everything. My health status, my criminal status, my bank accounts, my everything. Silky, last word to you. Yeah, it's it's a real risk. And, and you know, what digital ID in particular lends itself to is the centralization of lots of different bits of data. And obviously, Yoti is offering one particular um, product, but that can work as a part of as part of an ecosystem where it is a massive centralized digital ID. And also, they have offered before um, networked data sharing, for example, between nightclubs. It was certainly a product that was in development when I went to their offices once before. So, you know, we have to be cautious about what we're building here. I would I, I, I would encourage scepticism when people tell you that it's about increasing access inclusion. This might not be a very good thing to be included in for everyone.